Hello, Brooms Island Community Church. I must say it's a little odd coming to you via video. It's not my regular. I much prefer to see you all face to face. But we're down here in my basement and uh, going to be reaching out to you with the word. Just wanted you to have something uh, that you could play and enjoy uh, the word of God and fellowship as we can through the video camera. Let me start off with a psalm. Psalm 142 it says this. It's a psalm of David. It was when he was in the cave and Saul was chasing after him. It says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who knows my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to my right and see, no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. Listen, this coronavirus, it'll pass. God didn't wake up and say, hey, where, where'd this come from? God knew it was coming 2,000 years ago when Christ was on the cross. Some 10,000 years ago when he created this planet, he knew that we would be facing this crisis. I miss being together with all of you. Perhaps you feel like David here. Just where is my refuge? I, f I feel abandoned. I feel deserted. Listen to what he says. Verse 5. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your family that you've called Brooms Island Community Church. Thank you that we are all safe and of good health. God, I pray that you'll be with each one. Lord, open up our eyes, our ears, our heart to receive from you. May your message be clear, and we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I miss you guys. I miss the announcements. I miss uh, being before you and just being able to fellowship with you, hugging your necks. There's six foot difference now, all this stuff going on. Listen, God is still in control. God has this under control. God has you in his hand. He is your refuge. I want to continue with our sermon series. I figured it was a good place to, to continue because it's interesting. We're going to be going through Genesis 15 through 17. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it's today's sermon title is God's path or your own. God's path or your own. Sometimes things don't go as planned. Sometimes we have plans, but God's ways are so much different than our ways. We, we think we know the way to get where we want to go. When I was planning out the spring sermons, uh, I, I did not intend to be making them on a video like we are here uh, because we're forbidden to meet together. Listen, real quick. Thank God for the people that we have up in the district who made the decision before others did to say, hey, you know what, we're going to shut down our churches because we don't want to be uh, a receptacle for people to be able to receive this virus from each other. Listen. God's hand is on us, but it doesn't mean that we aren't going to suffer things. The scripture is clear that we're going to suffer. So we didn't want to be someone who was going to possibly uh, pass this along to someone else. We, we did not want to be that church. Okay. Also, I think of it kind of like a snow day. We've had to cancel church due to snow and no one called and complained and said, Pastor, why are you looking out for us? Why are you trying to keep us safe? Listen, God's got you. And we just care about you. So, again, when I was making up this sermon series and, and studying for it, I had no idea that I'd be doing it the way we're doing it right now. But you know what? God knew. God knew. He, it wasn't a surprise to him. Sometimes we know God's plan. And when things don't happen the way we think it should or in the speed we think it should, we feel the need to help God out. Have you ever done that? I know I have. I've been in situations where I know I know the destination. So I figure I'll, I'll help God out with the quickest way to get there. And sometimes the quickest way isn't the best way. I think of the children of Israel as they went through the desert. And they're going through all the trials and stuff that they were going. When they left Egypt from slavery, they did not go the quickest route to their destination. God took them the long way. 
And there was reasons for that. They needed to be, they had been in slavery for over 400 years and they needed to build themselves up as a nation under God. Not as these people that just came out of slavery with no uh, control. Their lives were controlled. It was dictated to them day by day how to live. So here now, God takes them through the desert and, and takes them the long way so that they can learn to trust in him. So they can learn to trust in Moses, whom God had appointed over them. So sometimes we think we know the best way. We try to help God out, give him a little, little help, because perhaps we, we think God maybe forgot about us. Maybe we think that God isn't quite sure what he's doing. I don't know. Sometimes we just, we just get ahead of the game. But I'm here to tell you that God does not need our assistance at all. He'll sometimes invite us to be a part of his plan, but too often we try to do things in our own strength, in our own power, instead of waiting for God. It's not a good way to be. We need to learn to trust God in everything. In the coronavirus, we need to learn to trust God. In our workplace, we need to learn to trust God. In our homes, we need to learn to trust God. Everything that goes on, we need to learn to trust God. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Listen to what, what's in, in the scripture here. This is right after, if you remember the last time we were together, is when Abram had gone and saved Lot because he was captured in that war between the nine kings, five and four, and the five won, and, and Lot was taken away, and he came, and he saved him, and, and the king of Sodom had told him, hey, here, let me give you some of the goods, and he said, I swear to God that I would not take anything from you. So we're right after that, and it says, after this, after everything I just went over, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Here's what God said. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your very great reward. We need to remember that. We need to remember that God is our shield. Listen to verse 2. But Abram said, Oh, sovereign Lord, sovereign Lord. He recognized that God was in control. What can you give me since I remain childless? Remember, God had already told him he was going to come and take over the land of Canaan, that, that Abram was going to take over Canaan, that his descendants were going to be like the stars, like the sand on, on the shore. Wouldn't even be able to be counted, and it would just be nations because of him. And he says, listen, listen to what he says. He says, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be left my heir. That's how it was set up back then. If you had no kids, it would go to the servant. So he's saying, the servant of mine will have everything. I don't even have an heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord. He had faith. Remember, faith is, is when you know something's going to happen that hasn't happened yet. It's easy to have faith when you see it because there's no faith needed. It's already there. Okay? When I sat down in this chair, I, I, I had an element of faith that it would hold me. I've used it before, so I had a, a little bit of trust in it. But we use faith when we're not sure, when there's no pure evidence of it. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain the possession of all of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. 
Abram brought these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Adam, dro or Adam Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a dark sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Praise the Lord. Let's just stop there. Listen, God knew that they were going to be in slavery. God knew that they were going to be enslaved. He tells Abram this. He said, look, you're going to have this great nation, but they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. Sometimes we forget that part. Sometimes we forget that we go through trials, that we go through tribulations. Listen, that was generations, plural, of people. People who had lived, died, their offspring lived, died, their offspring lived, died, their offspring maybe lived long enough to see this. This, this exile, the exodus out of slavery, but more than likely died and in their kids. Generations lived in this slavery. There was whole generations that knew nothing but slavery and God knew it was going to happen to the people whom he called. So understand he's called you. But there may be some slavery in your life. And I'm, I'm not speaking of literal slavery like it was here. But there may be some things in your life that you're not happy with. There may be some things going on in your life that you're not pleased with. It may be with you generations. But know that God's promises are true. Listen. But I will punish the nations they serve as slaves. And afterwards they will come out with great possessions. If you recall, and we'll get into it as we get into the exile. If you recall from your scripture readings, though, when they left, the Egyptians were giving them gold, giving them silver, giving them, them uh, flocks and all this stuff, gave them all of these things. They came out with great possessions, just as Abram had come out of Egypt with great possessions. If you remember, because he had his wife Sarai lie and say she was his sister. However, you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And then when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. Remember the animals that he had cut in half, passed through the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant. It was a blood covenant. Blood had to be spilt and a living being had to be sacrificed. This is a foreshadowing of what Christ is going to do on the cross. When the sun had darkened and the, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, from the land of the Kenites, the Kezanites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Pisazites, the Raphites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gigashites, and the Jezubites. Then we come to chapter 16. Listen, that's an awesome promise. What has a little bit of doom in there? Let me, let me go through my notes here, because I'll just preach on and, and take up this whole camera, the whole video here. Listen, under God's promise. God promised this stuff to him. God promised the land to Abram. Abram asked how he would know when he has no offspring of his own. And God assured him that he will have offspring, and Abram believed the Lord is credit to him as righteousness. God's promises include the good as well as the gloom and doom. So now we're going to move on to point two, if you're following along in the little handout that I mailed you. A wife trying to help. Men, don't nudge your wives. This is not the time to do it. Listen to what happens. Let me read it for you. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar, 
Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, speaking of Hagar, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, Did I miss something? No. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge, may the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. Listen, listen, listen. If your wife ever comes to you and says, take my coworker to be your wife, and I, say no. Say no, children. That is just wrong. We don't want to do that. Listen, we, we know this was a bad situation. There's a couple things going on in here. Sarai has surrendered and said, look, clearly God does not see it fit for me to start a family. She even said she thought perhaps I can build a family through her, through Hagar. But then once Hagar became, president, became pregnant, she despised Sarai. Now imagine, if you will, a, hand, a maidservant. I, I imagine, and, and I could be off here, but just, uh, just go with me down this little rabbit trail. But I imagine that there was a good connection there between Hagar and Sarai. That Sarai would even mention to do this. That, that, that Hagar took good care of Sarai, and vice versa. Sarai took good care of Hagar. So there was a good relationship. Perhaps Sarai had even confided in Hagar and let her know, hey, you know, I really I want to have this, these children for, for my husband. God's made him a promise. It's not happening. Surely there was some form of discussion there. She didn't just come home one day and say, hey, by the way, you're marrying my husband. And again, we're not going to go into um, uh, marrying multiple people or anything of that nature. I understand it's, it's Old Testament things that happened back then. They're weird people. They were weird. But here's the thing. When Hagar became pregnant, she began to despise the person whom she was taking care of. The person whom she uh, perhaps helped her get dressed, perhaps made her bed, perhaps took care. Whatever it was that she did, she was her maidservant. But now she's being spiteful, despising Sarai. Because she knows she has something that Sarai can't have. She knows that she can provide for Abram something that Sarai could not provide. So listen to what happens. First of all, Sarai convinces Abram to do this. Really? Really? Who does not see disaster written all over this? But Abram listens. Then Hagar becomes pregnant. Hagar despises Sarai. Sarai blames Abram for her suffering. This is your fault because you got her pregnant because I told you to have a child with her. Listen, listen. Gentlemen, if you're anything like me, you just nod and go, you're right, hon. You're right. Whatever it is, you just say, you're right. That's how you have long marriages. I know you know these things. This isn't anything new. So I can just imagine Abram, sure, sure, honey, this was all my fault. What was I thinking? What was I thinking listening to you? Hagar becomes pregnant. She despises Sarai. Sarai blames Abram for her suffering. If you read on it, I encourage you to read all three chapters. Hagar despises Sarai. Sarai blames Abram for her suffering. Abram tells Sarai to do as she wishes with Hagar. That's where I stopped reading. But listen to what continues to happen. Sarai actually mistreats Hagar. Hagar runs away. I don't want to be mistreated. I don't want to be, be beaten or whatever's going on there. So she runs away. An angel finds her and says, hey, you need to go back. God will be with you. Hagar returns and she has a son, which Abram names Ishmael. Ishmael, which means God hears. So hear me. Abram believed this was God's answer. 
Abram believed that what his wife had told him was accurate. Abram believed that, that the information he was given was true, that it would, it would help God's plan. He, God hears me. God, Because if you remember, we just read that, God, that Abram said, God, I don't even have any offspring. God hears. Look, now I have offspring. Mm, but it wasn't God's plan. This wasn't God's plan. So 13 years later, 13 years later, Ishmael is now 13 years old, just like my son Josh is 13. And I want you to know, a uh, little shout out to my son, because we all know that church cannot survive without him. He does everything and anything I ask him to. And even tonight, I took over his basement. Usually, he's over here to my right, uh, playing some video games. He graciously gave it up because I gave him no choice. And uh, so thank you, Josh, for letting me do this. Um, Chapter 17 of Genesis, listen. When Abram was 99 years old, Ishmael's 13, Abram's 99. The Lord appeared, 13 years. Remember how I tell you, read the scripture, understand it. We talk about the journey of Abraham and Isaac, which will be coming up shortly. And we talk about those three days that they walk and what must have happened in those three days. For 13 years, Abram believed Ishmael was God's answer. Believed that Hagar, being his second wife, was God's answer. God hears Ishmael. God hears my cry. God heard my thing and answered me. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant. Remember, animals cut in half. Abram's out there shooting off the birds of prey. Fire comes and walks between them. The covenant of blood that was made with him. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. Listen, Abram means exalted father. Back when he was born, his father named him exalted father. For 86 years, he had no children. No children. Exalted father. How rough that must have been, 80, 85 years before, 85 and three months before Hagar was even pregnant. 85 years walking around, even with God giving a promise that you're going to be the father of nations. Your name means exalted father. Like an empty promise. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Then he had faith when God told him, you will have heir of your own, of your own flesh. And he believed. And here for these 13 years, he's believed that Ishmael is that promise, um, the delivery of that promise. So he says, you'll no longer be Abram, you'll now be Abraham, which means the father of many. So he goes from an exalted father to the father of many. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. And kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. And generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now as an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for generations to come. 
and I'm not going to go through, but right here is where, if you remember, they, they, they had killed the animals in the first covenant when they were split in half. And God, I, again, I encourage you to read there verses 9 through 14. He talks about the circumcision and the covenant of their own flesh. Now, many people, not, not even out of religious beliefs, but they do this uh, just for hygiene and other things now with their infant child who uh, doesn't remember anything about it. Thank God. But listen to me, when Abraham did it, he, he did it to himself? To his 13-year-old son, Ishmael? To all the male people in his camp, hundreds, maybe thousands of people, he took a knife and made this covenant before God. And God made it very clear that in this, in the children of Israel, you were to be circumcised. If you weren't, you were an outcast. If you came and, and you were an outsider and decided to live among the uh, Israelites, you were going to be circumcised if you wanted to live there. So it was a serious oath. It was a serious commitment. It was a covenant. But listen to verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, she will know, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. Now, Sarai means princess. Let me get this right. And Sarah means my princess. It had a more exalted meaning to it than just Sarai. So, of course, who doesn't name their little daughter princess? But now she's my princess, a more exalted position, if you will, to be the princess of these nations that he is, he is saying is going to happen. I will bless her the, so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Not from Hagar. From her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed. And he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear me a child at ninety? Abraham said to God, If only, if only, listen, I, I think, I think, I hear what you're saying, God, but I might have a, a solution. If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. How often do we think that our way is the right way? God laid it out for him. Ed, Ed let's be honest. I'm 47 years old. And I don't plan to have any more children. Because I want to enjoy them as they grow up and enjoy them. And I don't want to be 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old having a child. I get it. I, he did it at 86 and raised a young man and now he's 13. I get it. But when God speaks, we need to listen. We need to be obedient. We need to submit to his will. Then God said, yes. He asked if, if Ishmael could live under his blessing. He said, yes, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Abraham just laughed when he found out about this. I will establish my covenant with him and an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Ishmael means I, uh, to be heard by God. Do, he heard me. I heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful, and he will greatly increase in numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household, or brought with his money every male in his household, and circumcised them. Listen. God promises that Sarah will be 
the one who has the son, who will carry the blessing, whom God will bless, whom God's covenant will be with. He says he'll bless Ishmael as well because Abram, Abraham had asked for it. But what do you know? Did you know that Ishmael ends up being an important prophet and a patriarch of Islam? Of the people that still are fighting everyone else in the world today? Think about that. I can't imagine being being the father of Hitler, the grandfather of Hitler, the great grandfather, the great great grandfather of Hitler. I can't imagine that. But you know what? Hitler's rule came to a, to an end. We are still fighting Islamic terrorists. They are still fighting the very people whom God's covenant is with. They are still trying to take the land of Israel from the people that God promised it to. This is what happens when we take things into our own hands. This is what happens when we say, my way is a little better than yours, God. Or perhaps, perhaps it's not even that. Perhaps we're just too impatient. Perhaps we're too much like, hey, I don't have time to wait for your way, God. Or maybe this is your way. And listen to me. I've mentioned this a number of times in a number of sermons, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a whole series on this. I, I have one that I've done before, and I can definitely do that, about praying and hearing from God. And too many times, I've done it. I've done it. God opened the doors that need to be opened. Close, slam shut the doors that need to be shut so I don't walk the wrong way. God, open up the doors that I need to walk through. What if Abram had been praying that? God promised him and said, listen, you're going to have a son from your own flesh. Wife comes along. It ain't going to be me. Look, I've tr we've tried. It ain't working. Let me give you my maidservant. She's faithful. She's good. She'll take it. Okay, let's let's just drop the whole thing about marrying someone else. Let's just cuz that that just that that offends our, our culture. It offends our mindset. But take that out of it just for a minute. If you're praying, God, open the door for me that needs to be open and close the doors that need to be closed, and an opportunity comes along for you to have what it is that you believe you've been promised, would you not also have walked through that door? That that is such a fallacy that we pray these things. That we it's <laughs> Hear me. God will reveal his plans to you. You need to be patient and listen to them. I, I'm reminded of Joseph down in the pit. God, open the doors that need to be open. He didn't pray this. I don't know. I'm just, I'm helping you think through this, walking you through something that's in scripture. It's in scripture with Abraham here. It's in scripture with Joseph. He's in a pit. Can you imagine if he prayed, God, just send me a rope. If I just had, here comes the rope. Oh, thank you, God. And he goes to slavery. I'd be feeling a little defeated right there. But here, Abram, who turns into Abraham for 13 years, believed that he had followed what God wanted. Listen, I don't know. Maybe you've been doing something or you did something that you have believed for 13 years, for 23 years, for however long, that you are in God's path. We need to evaluate our lives. We need to take a look at what God has promised us. We need to take a look at what God has given us. For some of us, we have talents and gifts that God's given us, and we're like, ah, eh, I've moved up in age. It's no longer my time. It's no longer my time to be involved in that. And you know what? Maybe that's true. I don't know. I am not here. The, the last thing I want to do is guilt trip anyone into doing anything. I want you to be God tripped. I, don't, I made that up. I want God to influence you that you want to do things. Listen, may, maybe, maybe your time is, is done. Listen, being a police officer is a young man's game, if you will. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm still young in my mind. I'm out there doing what I need to do. I'll, I'll chase down the bad guys. Hopefully they don't run. But listen, I'll chase them down if I need to. But I can see the writing on the wall. I can see in 20 years, I will not be doing that job anymore. It's a young man's game. But you know what? 
I'm a great teacher. I don't say that to, to puff myself up or anything of that nature. I love to teach. God has given me the gift of teaching. I teach here at church. A lot of times my sermons are more teachings than they are preachings, and that's fine. I teach at work. I teach a number of classes at work. Y'all know that I love traffic law. I teach traffic. I could come back and teach people how to do things that my body can no longer do. Listen to me. God is never done with you. 100 years old, he has a son. His wife, who's 90, has a son. Oh, my. God is not done with us. We need to listen. We need to be in his in his path, not our own, not what we think it should be. When we try to help God, we can royally mess things up. The Islamic everything. Because Abram, well, I don't say because Abram listened to his wife. Well, that's part of it, because Abram didn't wait for God. The entire Islamic nation. If you don't have direction from God, listen, don't move. Wait for his direction. He will guide you. He will let you know. When they were out in the wilderness, they had a pillar of fire uh, that would lead them at night and a, pillar, a cloud pillar that would lead them by day. And that's awesome. And sometimes, yes, we wish that we would have that. God, give me the pillar so I can just know. But you know what? They, didn't, they would set up camp. I don't know if any of y'all have ever gone camping or not. It takes me a little bit of time to set up a tent. I'm fairly decent at it. But they set up tents, y'all. They were big tents. I held multiple people. It wasn't a quick little, hey, set up in 20 minutes and tear it down. And Why well, does it always take longer to tear it down? Okay, it doesn't take longer to tear it down. But if you want to pack it up neatly so it fits back in that bag, you better. It takes a little bit of time. So it wasn't like that. They would be in places for weeks, months at a time. And then when the pillar went up, whether it was the cloud, whether it was the fire, it was time to start packing up. We need to listen to God. We need to hear from God and not move until God tells us to move. Until we see that pillar, whatever that is for you. Until we know that God is telling us it's time to get ready. That's when we move. Too often we just want to go around and God opened the door. Well, you didn't close it, so it must be good for me to do it. The Islamic nation came out of a decision like that. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I've tried to call everyone. If I didn't get in touch with you, call me back. I want to hear from everybody. Um, but I love to call you. I'll be calling you every week if I can to just get in touch with everybody and make sure everybody's doing well. If you have prayer requests, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm attaching a letter to go with this. It has my email address on it, my phone number. If you don't already have it, it's in there. Call me, send me an email, drop me a line. If you're on Facebook, say hello, whatever. I want to know that you're doing okay. We're, we're doing church different. Listen, church is not a building. We have a beautiful building. I've said that over and over again, but the church has nothing to do with that building. If an earthquake hit today and swallowed that building up, we would still be the body of Christ. We would still be Brooms Island Community Church. Coronavirus hits. We're still the Brooms Island Community Church. God is still faithful. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your people. Thank you, thank you for your word. God, I pray that you'll just touch each person that's listening right now. May your Holy Spirit be on them. Give them direction, God. Whatever it is that's in their life, whatever's there that perhaps they've stepped out, maybe they've done things on their own that they shouldn't have done, and then it's been time, 13, 20, two years, however long. God, you could still redeem it. God, you could still redeem it. We could still be faithful to you and listen to you. Give us your direction. Give us your guidance. Show us how we can be your hands and feet to the people around us in this time of crisis, God. Just as when 9-11 happened, Lord, people just flooded the church looking for answers. God, they can't come to the church building, but they can still go to the church. Let the church go to them. Let us be people that are light. A light. 
We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I miss worshiping with you. I miss the music. I miss announcements. Josh doing the, the candles. But remember the candle. Be the light. Don't hide it under a bushel. Take it with you. Be the hands and feet of Christ to your neighbors, to the people that you... Listen, if you're going to the store, be careful. Offer to your neighbor, hey, I'm going to the store. Can I get something for you? Look out for each other. Look out for your neighbors. That's how they see Christ in you. Jesus went and met the needs first. Met the needs first. Then he shared about the gospel. Show people that you care. Show people the love of Christ. It says, they will know us by our, by our love. By our love. Thank you all. God bless you. Let me bless you. There it is. I just passed it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to do some more of these so that you'll have them and look for them in your mailbox. God bless.